good evening everyone i think without wasting much time i first request our expert panelist uh, for the session 4 that is fellowship and beyond in vitro retina and uvia and basically to all uh, applying to other sub specialties also i request our expert panel dr avinash patange sir dr guru prasad sir dr lalit verma dr kim sir is here yes dr dr unni dr mahesh ji and dr naresh babu i don't know if all of you all sit in the front who will sit at the back i request all of you to please join the the expert panel we should start in a minute <laughs> sir now you are first benchers club not the back benchers club the past president of vitrotna society of india and he'll be talking to us on the initiation into the initiation into clinical learning thank you shrinivas thanks to dr chitra and her team of arc for putting a very different program which is interesting and well what i'm going to talk in the next 8 uh, minutes or so is based on totally on personal experiences with no data from here and there and uh, having trained fellows now for about 22 years i feel let's define what is the purpose of a good clinical fellowship i feel it is the integration and application of the theoretical knowledge from academic training they've already done a academic training in their masters excuse me unfortunately academic training also has to be imparted along the journey of the fellowship evaluation of strengths and identification of their limitations development and refinement of clinical skills consistent with the scope of practice and finally the goal is advancement from constant supervision to an independent practitioner that's what it is all about in that super speciality more so pertaining to vr it's a tougher uh, journey fellowship training follows certification in a primary specialty like vr or a sub specialty and focuses on distinct and advanced clinical and ac academic skills this phase of medical education is growing in prevalence definitely all across the globe and more so in india but has been an invisible phase of post graduate training lacking standards of for education and accreditation as well as funding it has differed all over from center to center when i structured my fellowship program i thought the initiation would be 2 months initially to get used to a vr program in a two year fellowship rotate the fellows in the outpatient between the various consultants and and the imaging uh, facility quality time post opd in discussions to create and multiply interest in the field share your journey honestly the challenges the achievements and failures what i found was lacking when i joined my fellowship also at sn and before that when other fellows joined me are patient communication skills they need they have freshly qualified from a post graduate institute which could where they seldom get enough time to develop patient communication skills or there is hardly any training in that field i feel development of appropriate body language non commanding but simple compassionate communication is most important for fellowship programs because here these are different patients and you will be spending more chair time with with them as many programs are in institution where patients come with high expectations many private or semi private institutions observation of these skills and they were their development is an important part of initiation into fellowship training and time initially is well spent in the same they have to be inspired and motivated these are the successful stones to a these are the stepping stones to a successful program and to ensure your 
fellows don't end up getting absorbed in the cataract and refractive stream after doing a VR fellowship. Inspiring facts about your own mentors. Well, this used to happen way back in our time when you used to do a VR fellowship and then get attracted into, you know, anterior segment uh, practice. Explain the, the journey is slow but satisfying. They can be inspired by biographies and contributions of stalwarts in the development of the specialty. Lessons from history are the best in any field and are laden with wisdom of experience. An inspired fellow will be a diligent learner. Time and effort has to be devoted to orientation, reading on indirect ophthalmoscopy and the basic anatomy first, rather than them jumping onto the bandwagon of seeing patients. Indirect ophthalmoscopy and drawing the fundus. Fundus drawing and spending time with a pre-op patient is one of the most rewarding experience for an initial fellow, rather than jumping the queue to the wide field imaging bandwagon, which became more prevalent during the COVID era and which today is, is available at most centers which impart training. The concept of indirect ophthalmoscopy and drawing carries forward to the development of skills for scleral buckling, which are very important. Seeing the fundus on indirect ophthalmoscope in a relaxed manner is good time spent getting used to picking up subtle findings which will hold in good stead in busy outpatient schedules later. Now, what has happened? And then time also has to be spent using the Vogue 90D and other lenses and getting used to the fundus landmarks and the Im inverted image. They have to be cautious before they start doing PRP, which is the first procedures which are given to fellows to avoid causing damage during the learning process. They have to know how to, you know, orient themselves to these. They have to be introduced to the di Bibles which there are modern books, there are modern resources, there's the net now, but the modern old day Bibles remain the same from where we all learned. Now why I say fundus drawing is a really a disappearing art because earlier the patient's time spent was different. Now you schedule, you see a patient in the outpatient you schedule him for surgery, it's not a previous day admission, at least in the cities, it's a morning admission. So there's hardly any time the fellows get to interact with the patients. And it all boils down to ha having a quick look prior to the OT or uh, taking a wide field image. Uh, so I feel this is the fellows, if not every patient, they should be drawing some of the patients. While once patient is being operated, one fellow can be drawing another patient and then assist in the sur surgery he has, you know, the patient he has drawn, done the fundus drawing of. The wide field image gives us a lot of information. You can toggle magnification on the screen, but the mental exercise and art of exploring the fundus by the clock hour and drawing has vanished. I still find fundus drawing very important a thing in the initiation. History taking, another art which has to be really emphasized. They are in a hurry to see patients, I feel, initially. When most of the diagnosis can be cornered to some extent on the history. They have to spend time with the imaging optometrist in the imaging room, pick up the skills of image acquisition and angiography. I remember the way Dr. Chandran Abraham used to emphasize, we know, have to know every part of the machine we are going to use and also know the optics before we inject the patient with the dye and start acquiring images. So, so these are some of my thoughts, leaving you with points to ponder and discuss. Thank you very much once again, Srinivas. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, so pre-COVID era, it used to be uh, less audience and uh, sometimes in the retina sessions and it just used to be yeah. talking about, but now in the post COVID era, what it has shown is the recordings. So these yes, recordings will definitely be relayed or reviewed in the, the ARC tube. So I uh, ask all the speakers not to get uh, disencouraged uh, by this, but definitely this, the, the recordings, we are going to make it speaker wise and send it across in the YouTube library of ARC. So 
uh, coming to the question, I'll quickly start with Dr. Unni. In the first few months, say for example, you must have, have your own curriculum. How the fellow should start, whether you should start with the laser, injections. So how briefly, if you can put up your curriculum of how you train your fellows in the first initial three to six months. Um, see, uh, one thing I, I found really lacking and uh, the cornerstone is doing a good indirect ophthalmoscopy. So for me, uh, that's what the fellow does in the initial part. They, they are w with us in the room, we show them and we make them draw drawings. Where we have a patient waiting for us, they go to another room, draw a drawing and bring it to us. Color coding uh, is something that we uh, emphasize on so and that, and they have a very strenuous one month posting in the imaging lab. So uh, not about interpretation, but even we make them take the OCTs, take the B scans, take, uh, do, go to the ERG room, photography. So that's what our first two to three months are. It is basically a lot of indirect ophthalmoscopy, uh, seeing their skills with that and uh, the imaging uh, lab. So in the Western world, I have seen, in just in the first day of your fellowship, you are taken into the VR and you are taught how to put a trocar. But the same curriculum is slightly different coming to the Indian scenario, where I've seen in many institutions, they start after three to six months. So what is your basic take on whether we should really wait for that much of time to for the fellows to enter the OT or start doing the practices or I feel the first two months should be well spent outside the OR and with all due respects I've seen patients coming to me from the west where they have had a fundus image and an OCT but a C fan sitting in the periphery has been missed so I feel in the, what Unni said Indirect ophthalmoscopy as an art has to be emphasized. And funders drawing, I feel Dr. Kim will also say, and uh, that's the way we have all done it. Uh, one has to be in a dark room with the inverted fundus paper on a clipboard and draw the fundus to really know what it's all about. Yeah, actually, uh, we also uh, ask them to do the basic things and including little refraction, sir, because yeah. many of the uh, postgraduates, they don't know how to do refraction. In uh, Shankar Nathralia, there was a general OPD clinic where we used to train refraction. That we even now remember. Mm. So those things, electronic medical records, then uh, basics of investigation, uh, imaging room, then uh, go to the OR after getting little strong in the fundus uh, drawing. Yes, yeah. Because actually there is always a complaint. First three months, the fellows will say they are not giving me laser, they are not giving me injections. Last six months, they are always calling me for laser, they are always calling me for injections. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's what happens basically. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Your question is more pertinent basically because, see the postgraduate training in our country is yeah. very bad, rather quite far. So here basically they are not even exposed to indirect ophthalmoscopy to say basic clinical evaluation, good clinical evaluation. In, 95% of the medical colleges churning out postgraduates. So we can't put it in West, they, because they there, if you look at the proficiency, they are expected to know by the time they do their basic postgraduate degree, at least in direct ophthalmoscopy, they know what is fundus uh, imaging and all those things. No, so I for fellowship, naturally, a step would be ahead. Here, we have to first get them to the level of a postgraduate. Yeah. I would beg to disagree on one. I don't think postgraduate training is uniformly bad. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But communication skills definitely in the busy public hospitals is lacking totally. Yeah, this is something very important because when you're especially coming to retina practice, you need a lot of maturity in the way you handle patients. Exactly. And you see most of the, as uh, Prashant mentioned, the postgraduates coming directly right after the postgraduation mm -hmm. coming into fellowship. You see, that's lacking in them. For people who have had some practice and those coming to retina are definitely very different in handling patients, especially retina patients, uh, compared to those who are coming directly out of the, uh, you know, their post-graduation. Especially from those university, I mean, institutions where they've had little exposure to patients in general. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. We'll, uh, I, uh, I request our next speaker, Dr. A.S. Guru Prasad, sir, the Director of uh, Clinical Services and the Head of VR Department at M.M. Joshua Institute, Hubli. 
Sir, uh, before he sets up, uh, one question to Kim, sir. As you said that, yes, I agree that the first they have to be a little bit brought up. and But think in an institution where a postgraduate has finished from Arvind, Arvind Madurai, right? Because in some cases, yes, I agree, as Dr. Prashant said, the, the curriculum or the, the clinical examination, especially the indirect ophthalmoscopy, also might not be learned. So in those cases, I think many of the fellowship directors would agree they will make a tailor-made curriculum for those single postgraduate. First go six months here, do get the tissue handling and everything and then come back. But what you said, does it apply if he finish his uh, post-graduation from Arvind and he applies for the fellowship in Arvind, will it apply the same? By policy, no postgraduate can directly get into any fellowship programs uh, at Arvind. If they are a fellow of, uh, I mean, PG of Arvind, they can't directly get into a fellowship program at Arvind, uh, especially these uh, MS programs. They have to spend time in general ophthalmology before they can come into a uh, fellowship program. Okay. So that answers you. Yes, answer. Yeah, also, uh, the same point. See, we can't vary the tenure of the program depending on where persons come from. But the thing is, we need everybody to come to that same level of benchmarking in terms of, you know, background information. Also, Retina, uh, like uh, Prashant also mentioned, is very variable. I won't go to the extent of saying 95% is bad, but at least it's very variable. So you, those six, six months not just gets in into, you know, that level of proficiency, but also into the culture of the department. And then you uh, proceed from there onwards. So it's like hand-holding them through. Thank you, sir. I request uh, Guru Prasad, sir, to... Please uh, speak on the topic, the surgical exposure, how to excel oneself. Thank you, ARC, and uh, thank you, moderator, Dr. Sinvas. Uh, how to excel is uh, actually, I can answer it in one one slide. This is the slide which I was alluding to, surgical training during fellowship, how to excel. The answer would be in points, observation uh, of, se uh, se of the seniors, assisting seniors and mentors, doing simple steps under supervision, and then, of course, graduating to doing the entire surgery independently. These are the basic steps of uh, learning uh, and excelling. But there is an intrinsic uh, factor to that too. There has to be a self-motivation, there has to be determination and hard work. That is, uh, in, in one word, what you are made up of. So what you are made up of also helps you to excel. So uh, keen observation, let me now uh, elaborate on each of them. Shadow the best seniors and teachers during the after hours. So you might be posted in the OT, but after the OT also there's something going on in the uh, in the OPD or in the OT, after your duty time is over, you can always go back and see what's going on. And there is always now the uh, digital methods of uh, seeing what is going on in, in great detail. And that way you can learn a lot from the seniors and mentors. So ask questions. This is one thing that uh, many people shy away from. They don't ask questions at all. They, uh, either we have to assume that they know everything or they don't know anything. So then question why and why not? I, I always encourage my, stu my fellows to ask me five questions every day about their basic doubts. Why and why not? Both they have to give me five each. At least to yourself you ask questions. You don't want to ask your teachers. And if you're shy to ask your teachers, at least ask yourself. However silly that may be because there is nothing called a silly question. Don't be stuck with basic doubts. Build concepts around the right evidence. Many of my fellows, at the end of one, one and a half years, they will ask me, sir, how does the flute needle work? They don't know how the backflush works. Sir, what are you doing? It seems magical. What is this going on? So this is something that is very common amongst the students, and we, we have to encourage them to ask questions and find out what the thing means to, the, means to surgery. Uh, assisting surgery is about getting involved. You have to get involved in the surgery. Unless you get involved and unless you don't just assist mechanically, you will not learn surgery. So both into the microscope and outside it, you have to see, and a good assistant uh, only can be a good surgeon. Refer to the literature uh, uh, every day. See, uh, go and see in the books, in the journals, what you saw that particular day, and every day you have to do that. This is, for example, uh, surgery under oil, membrane being removed under oil, a simple membrane at the macula causing traction. Under oil surgery is something that is done rarely, and they have to go and read it. And then there is a lot of literature available, books are there, top journals are there. You have to maintain a logbook. This is something I tell my students. I always haul them up and ask them, where is your logbook, show me. 
they always come and boast that they've done a particular step, and I, show, I ask them, where is their, your entry in the logbook? This is something that I think which we should all ask our uh, students to do, and make recordings of your own surgery, watch the recordings of mentors and seniors, and grab every oppor opportunity to edit videos of seniors in the department. This is something that will, will help them to learn more and more about surgery. Then coming to doing steps independently, Sometimes there can be a lack of uniformity in the way different consultants do in the department. For example, I may be doing differently and uh, the other consultants in the department may be doing things differently. So copy the best and easiest method that suits your skill level. This is what I tell them. Whatever works best in your hands, you do it. Integrate judiciously with what you learn from other sources. By other sources, I mean it's very obvious that it is a YouTube, YouTube videos. And, but don't try to do in a way that only experts can do. So, I may be able to do something with my left hand and my right hand simultaneously, but I, I always tell the juniors not to do that if they can't do it well. When allowed to uh, do the entire surgeries, of course, that is at a point when the mentor has full confidence in you. You have to be very careful, always keeping the patient's safety in mind. This is very, very important because we are, most of us uh, are trainers in private hospitals and we are uh, operating on private patients, paying patients. You have to have a low threshold for seeking a senior's help and don't go on an ego trip because the pain of goofing up lasts longer than the thrill of doing something successfully. This is something that I tell them, don't goof up and then feel bad about it. Be dependable in the department. The eye casualty is something that you should look forward to to work there. Uh, attend emergencies, emergency OTs like uh, coronary stool tears, emergency end of the mitis surgeries. Uh, that increases your surgical opportunity and uh, your ability to tackle challenges alone and always be available. It's very important. Don't switch off your phone and be resting. And then that is the how you become dependable and uh, that is how you gain the confidence of your mentors. So hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. When you teach, you also learn. So you teach your juniors. This is one. So uh, teaching juniors helps you help when, when you're teaching you're also learning. So learn and learn well, because if you can't explain it simply, you don't under, understand it well enough. That is what the saying goes. So learn well, teach and learn, and by teaching you learn again. So update your logbook and audit the day, day's work on a daily basis and discuss why your mentors do steps in a particular way. Learn about the machines. I think, the new, I think uh, like Dr. Shobit was saying about the floors in your gram, before you uh, actually, <coughs> inject. You have to know about the machine. So learn about the machines. There's no financial interest in this. I'm showing a set of uh, uh, instruments and equipment. Instruments, a uh, microscope. L do set it up instead of the board boy or the OT boy setting it up or the sister setting it up. You set it up on a give on a particular day to learn what the machine setting up is all about. <coughs> Coming to the intrinsic qualities that makes a good student, self motivation. What good is having a belly if there's no fire in it, they say. Wake up, drink your passion, light a match, and get to work. So fire in the belly is very important. The determination, that urge to learn is very, very important. Have the determination, eat, drink, and breathe surgery. So do surgery mentally. Surgery is like meditation. Practice, practice, and practice. Keep practicing mentally when you're not in the OT or in the hospital. Important thing, don't let anything demoralize you. Remain focused on the outcome, not on the obstacles. Failure is simply the opportunity to begin again, this time more intelligently. Very nice saying. And don't be discouraged. It's often the last key in the bunch that opens the lock. Attend CMEs and conferences like this. There are plenty of them today. Specialty conferences, VRSI is there. Retina clubs are there, retina forums are there basics, updates, advanced imaging, what uh, RIC is doing, uh, Dr. Unni and groups. So there's always a treasure of pearls to bring home by attending these conferences. Mantra for success is hard work. There's no shortcut for hard work. The more you sweat in peace, the less you bleed in war. That's what the saying goes. And fruit is a, is a fruit of hard work is the sweetest. Most important, again, is you should be fit, especially in VR surgery fellowship. So sound, body, sound mind in a sound body is something that is very, very important. 
for all VR surgeons right from the beginning, not necessarily at, at a senior age when those, your neck and back start talking. You should have it from the beginning. The PG course and fellowships are very demanding. So you have a series of them, many of them. Yoga and meditation especially help you <coughs> both for physical and mental uh, fitness. And I think one should practice it from day one. Post-operative care, I think this also Dr. Shobit has alluded to. It's as important. Patient is the real source of learning. Give due respect, be compassionate, be humble, wear a smile. Answer all his questions in, on the post-op day. A, a smile is a curve that sets everything straight. That is what the saying again goes. I put all these so that they are effective and uh, yeah, you should practice these. Because if something has gone wrong in the surgery and it's difficult to convince the patient, a smile is all that it, it takes to help set, thing, set uh, things uh, straight, uh, straight again. One of the many qualities of a great surgeon, remember. So copycat your seniors, mentors, anybody who inspires you. It may be your uh, fellows, your peers. Have the humility to learn from anyone, including juniors and paramedical staff, from the nurses who have worked longer than you, for longer years than you, uh, from the OT boys, OT girls, <coughs> who have been there for many years, much more uh, senior than you. Everything has, everyone has something to teach you if you are humble enough to learn. So if you can emulate your teachers, you are ready to innovate. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, a very nice presentation uh, with uh, very good pictures. It was self-explanatory. <coughs> sir, coming back to Avina sir's uh, dialogue. Katne ko milega. That was a nice thing which he asked it. Now, most of the fellows, I'm sure that they Kit, want more and more of milta hai. more and more of surgical chances. Kitna cutting milta. Hai. Kitna kitna chances milta hai. Kitna cutting milta hai. Yes, uh, Kim sir, that was a very pertinent uh, question, which I don't know if you were there in the first session where uh, when the uh, the person who wants to give for the interview, he came and asked. Uh, he didn't know who was Dr. Avinash, and he said, "Katne ko milega kya?" So now, most of the fellows, we have to agree that they want more and more surgical exposure, more and more these things. So what would you promise a fellow if he comes and asks you this question, that how much surgical chances am I going to get? I don't uh, have an answer. Like in the sense, we do have a curriculum for our fellows, like what they can do and what. But a person, the moment is asking those kind of questions, you understand what he is there for. So do you really need to take him into the fellowship? That's, you know, that... that With a pinch that, of a salt. Yeah, yeah. So I wouldn't really give a more importance to that part of it. Yes. So. Guru Prasad, sir. No, I just want to say that uh, I would like to tell them that they will get what they deserve. Basically, it's about how they perform, how they, how they work, how many hours of hard work they put in, how they uh, are able to do uh, the job that you have set out for them to do. All this matters and uh, I think that will co be commensurate with what they get. Kitna kaatne ko milega will depend on kitna kaam karenge. And uh, some, some uh, students will not learn surgeries. In spite of working hard, some are not cut out to be surgeons that we have also seen in our setup. Of course, it's rare in the present day. Many people, most of them, uh, nine out of ten will learn surgery, but one will somehow lag behind. For them, they will have to probably uh, increase the, the, the duration of fellowship. Sir, did you select that fellow who asked that question? Yeah, he was selected already. <coughs> so, so that after the interview, and he did reasonably well. So he is also, he is not here, but he will be tomorrow. So. <laughs> No, without naming him, I'm just asking in generally. Because so those are the questions we face during the interviews, we have to accept he is a, it. He's a quite successful guy. I don't want a name, he has three clinics. Okay, so, good. Yeah, so, but I think I'll just rephrase what Dr. Guru Prasad has just said. So, earn it. Right? Earn it. So, there is no harm in asking. Right. So, that's one aspect of it. Whether naive or not, that's a different issue. Whether we want to judge it or not, that's a different issue. So, but we enter... All of us had it at some point of time, wherever we are, how much of surgical opportunities we get, right? So earn it and uh, you do well, you get more surgery. You don't do well, so so, are we, so will be the number of surgeries what you're going to get. So 
there's no fixed number it's very dynamic in lv prasad you see it's very extremely dynamic and depends on how they perform and so do they get so i request our next speaker dr anand rajendran sir a very interesting topic how would i excel as a program director so before he sets up his talk a uh, question to uh, the panelist sir uh, now you are a very good uh, surgical mentor and the fellow says that i am he is doing a good vitrectomy in one month he has picked up now he is doing a good laser so do you have a set protocol again what steps to give that because in some institutions i see i do not agree with few of the this thing that he should not be given to peel the ilm he should not be given to touch the membranes let him wait for 6 months then he has to do so or you think that okay the sir, the boy is picking up and he should go on exceeding and he should do a complete uh, surgery even though if he is 6 months but you have fellows who have taken one year not not to complete it two things Narish, one sir. is uh, actually our fellows do ilm peeling at least 4 to 5 before the reason is very simple if you are not going to teach they are going to learn you just teach and take the credit it's as simple as that and it's not a great thing like peeling ilm is not a great thing number one number two the faster they learn the better for us fun. actually because if it's an ilm peeling as you said just for an example you do everything do induce the pvd don't create problem stain and then you call me i'll just peel I'll, uh, then my job is only for 2 minutes the rest they can do actually the only thing is as relax naresh uh, uh, will relax yeah, in the no, coffee no, room no no we can go to the other case and we can yeah. do actually so i think if they do more it is better for us and in fact you should teach your uh, fellows well because you don't know when you need them actually <laughs> is it agreeable with all the the panelists uh, there is yeah. de uh, depends on the ability of the, uh, yeah. uh, the person yeah. some people pick up fast they will get more more than that some people do less uh, problems they will create less problem they will get more and more uh, that is a general pattern you should have a policy where you ensure that the student will complete the term sometimes there used to be times when we had to uh, you know the students used to run away after some time and that was because we had given them so many chances that they were getting the confidence in the wings to fly away so that is one thing that we should keep in mind the if you you do the, you should definitely encourage them to learn at the same time they should not be over confident and find some reason to finish the uh, fellowship early and leave prematurely that's again uh, that's a very uh, valid point sir yeah. no that never happens actually don't give them the certificate it's as simple as that and that policy of not giving the certificate don't is important don't give them the certificate yeah. you just say that he has completed this many they just give the attendance certificate don't give the fellowship certificate no it's hard to convince naresh sir but uh -huh. if they go and ask him sir he might uh -huh. be convinced no, no, because no, no, of no, the no. Uh, no type of stories sometimes the fellows might build up because of course this is the open forum and we all know that what kind of stories some sometimes comes up with the fellows they try to you know uh, take the heart of the, the the other mentors but of course i believe if you have a uniform policy then that should not be uh, the problem at all yeah I, but you somehow came to know about our sir actually they will convince <laughs> it you are right <laughs> Okay, so I now request uh, Anand sir. It's a wonderful topic. I am eagerly waiting to listen for that. <coughs> yeah. So, uh, Peter Ratnan, you have fellowship. How I would excel as a program director, and there can be many takes to this. So, first thing is uh, the selection. You know, picking the right cherries. There's always this thing when you pick, you need to look at two things. We tend to look at the scholastic aspects, the aptitude, but I think it's also important to judge to some extent attitude. So while aptitude is king, attitude is everything. And uh, with the aptitude, that is more easily judged. You, uh, when you have a surfeit of fellows, we have an entrance exam. I remember uh, 20 years back, uh, there were hardly any fellows coming for retina, but now a huge number of people are coming and we've studied the applications. If you have that as a cluster, you can do an entrance exam in which it's important equally to look at comprehensive of health, core knowledge, as well as specialty knowledge, because you need people to be rounded figures. So core knowledge and applied knowledge together should be assessed in your examination format if you're having it. And it's best to do it in an objective way with MCQs, but you can also have re reasoning kind of questions. And when you have that kind of a exam format, you need to have a must-know category, a good-to-know category, and then the great-to-know category. And it's ideal when you're doing this to have a weighted scoring where there is more negative marking for those who miss out on the must-know. So, you know, you don't want somebody to know fantastic trivia but not know the essentials. 
Then also it's important to look at the background pedigree, uh, where they've done the undergraduation, where they've done the postgraduation from, because it takes a lot of hard work to get into a, you know, a really reputed institution to do that. And undergraduation, five years of MBBS is a tough course. So you cannot you know, fool that uh, with that. So you know, somebody who's come through that and has done well in his undergraduation, you know you're, you're looking at good material. Then also the awards, presentations, publications that they've managed to do in their undergraduate and postgraduation, I think that also has weightage. And in your Viva, which you are conducting, spotters are good for testing core knowledge, but I think it's also important to throw them clinical situations to see how they approach problems. Is it just a you know, one-fit formula or are they thinking? So all that is there from the aptitude point. Then attitude. Uh, this is not that easy to judge in a 10-minute you know, interview. You need to see, know if, is, is check if the patient is earnest, sincere. I mean, sorry, the <laughs> candidate is earnest, sincere, is uh, humble. We talked about, uh, you know, uh, that question of, you know, kitna cutting and all that. You know, you want to know whether people are showboats. And it's a very fine, you know, line of difference between somebody who's aggressive and somebody who's actually passionate. So you need to be able to, uh, you know, nose that out and that comes with experience. And it's also important to judge whether that person sitting in front of you is, has the capacity to be part of a team. I think that's very important, especially in uh, the setups that we work in. And also whether that person has clarity of purpose. Somebody spoke about, uh, Dr. Shobit said about, what, you know, what are you going to do four years, five years from now? I mean, whether some person has some sort of a roadmap ahead of him, or is it just to get a label of a degree? So that also needs to be uh, looked at. And if it is possible, if you don't have a large number of candidates, it's also good if the candidates interface with other consultants. This is what I'm, I've started doing in my uh, setup right now, that the candidate goes and sees the other consultants, and then you take your viewpoints of your colleagues also. So, you know, a junior colleague may have picked up something which you might have missed in 10 minutes. Another ideal thing is to have an observation period, you know, a week or so, because, you know, people can be very charming in 10 minutes of interview, but you can't really always do that over a week's time or a a two week period. So a good observation period would also help, but then you have to see whether it's feasible in your specific setup. Then a defined program is always a refined program. You need to put out, it's ideal if you can put out a well laid out curriculum, defined postings, rotations, so that candidate knows, you know, going forwards, I will have, this is where I will be doing this and they can focus or their reading or they are at least assured that they will be trained in these areas, UBR, ROP, oncology, perhaps electrophysiology. The learning objective is ideal if that is specified at different stages of fellowship. And we usually look at zero to three months, three to six, six to 12, 12 to 18, and 18 to 24. And we've actually, at, um, we have this in our uh, logbook also for the fellows where it's actually you know measured out and laid out right there, where not only is the first month and uh, second month, third month, all the uh, uh, aspects that will be looked at is there, but also why it is being done is also spelled out. I think a lot of effort went into putting this logbook out. There's a huge number of people who did that, credit to them. And uh, the purpose, say the second month, angiography posting, 16th, 30th month, uh, uh, th <coughs> 16th, 30th of the second month, the ultrasound posting, then third month you have UVA, fourth month OPD postings, and the purpose is also laid out. And this is why pertaining to your question earlier as to whether you can, you know, quick uh, jumpstart somebody on a surgical training, they will miss out on all these programs. So when you reach a six month, you know that everybody is benchmarked to that particular level uh, in terms of grounding. And then the surgical training then starts warming up uh, from that point onwards. And then you start with small steps, and then go on beyond. And again, expectations are laid out during the fellowship program, what they should do, the screening camps, uh, the presentations and uh, meetings and grand rounds, taking part in CMEs, et cetera. And the also the criteria on which candidates are continually uh, evaluated is also laid down so that they also need to know that these are things which will also be looked at apart from scholastic ability. So punctuality, taking responsibility to work, keenness, teamwork, etc., clinical, surgical, and academic skills also. So this is something I like to do, you know, uh, it's always being done. Uh, we put out the fellows posting and we divide all the things and then put all the fellows there so they know, not just do they know, the consultant also knows where the fellows are as well as, uh, you know, the staff, the paramedical staff knows where they are posted. And so there's a, there's a very clean uh, organization of work from that point of view. Then uh, also laid out is, you know, the, uh, not only is the specifics of the doing of procedures also laid out, but it's also, you know, why things are being done is also laid out so that there is a standard benchmarking across. And um, so are the duties also. Now, very importantly is the approach uh, that a candidate needs to take. So to reading, 
basically medical and surgical we'd like to tell them that you know they need to move be strongly grounded in the basics in the first six months is what we generally tell them then intermediate six to maybe 12 months then advanced training but then the reading also as i keep telling my fellows is it needs to be two tracked one is your theory which needs to go continuously in the background in an organized way like this basic intermediate advanced but also importantly case based so if you see a case you need to read up about that case and that is very critical so two track kind of reading one is the regular scholastic reading but on the side cases that you see you need to read up and come back to me the next day and tell me about that so to working up a case methodical approach needs to be worked up uh, i think dr shobhit also said don't just jump into the diagnosis go step by step history uh, clinical exam etc and specify a plan you'll see this theme recurring in my presentation specifying a plan we need to know what the candidate is thinking and commit to that so this will keep coming to surgery also importantly we've already touched upon this surgical workup meticulous charting and uh, specifying a surgical plan too to diff the approach to difficult clinical situations it's important for them not everything will have a clear cut answer especially in retina so they need to come up with a logical sequence of differentials common and then red very often you find very enthusiastic uh, candidates coming up with some fantastic diagnosis they've heard of in a conference or seen in a grand rounds and then just go just with that one particular diagnosis they may be completely missing the boat so uh, a logical sequence needs to be followed and that needs to be emphasized through the training program and finally most important to difficult patients how do you approach difficult patients so the diagnosis may be simple but the patient may be difficult so it's important for them also to focus on soft skills and this again i will come back to later communication compassion patience empathy an important thing is to win the patient you know so you may not may or may not be able to help them with the disease disease may have run its course is not much we can do but uh, you need to uh, the pa patient needs to believe in you then documentation i think this is very critical and especially in fast paced heavy volume clinics uh, documentation is critical i think uh, history taking systemic family ocular a focused history taking that is an art i think that needs to be that is something which needs to be gleaned from the mentors so that is uh, critical and that comes with experience and time and with training detailed clinical exam notes this is one part that need not be compromised this is not something that uh, uh, there needs to be any shortcut to so putting what you see in a very meticulous and very accurate manner has to be focused on diagrams i know a lot of us now have moved to electronic medical records that is becoming increasingly little difficult to you know do exactly what we were doing as our fellows you know doing a uh, handwritten diagrams but then that effort should always be there and that emphasis should be there from a program lead to the uh, fellows reporting of investigations i think that is also something which needs to be done it tends to get uh, pushed back uh, they just write the diagnosis but a logical sequence is how they arrived at the diagnosis looking at the different aspects of say a fluorescein angiogram or b scan needs to be specified and then this is what i may keep talking about specify the managed plan management plan let them commit tell them to commit to a plan what would you do how will you manage this case what is your ch surgery choice prepares the mindset for the uh, candidate for post fellowship uh, and independent position writing clear prescriptions is important it, i mean very often you know when you know, now of course with electronic records things come automated and a lot of things the system does for you but going back when they leave they will not always have emr with them so they you need to write the dose exact specific duration everything surgical notes need to be very detailed intraop diagram this is very important not just from a training point of view but honing them so that from a medical legal point of view later all the complications intraop needs to be recorded very carefully post op instructions should be mentioned extremely carefully so all these things are very uh, critical to the point of training and this is how we encourage uh, fellows to you know document in our log books we have specific pages for lasers for uh, intraop outpatients etc and proficiency with diagnostic i think this is very important it's part of the skill matrix we need to know how to not just you know interpret but also do when they go out i keep telling them here you may have technicians but when you go out you'll have to do everything yourself so you need to get that hands on understanding and again people talked about you know uh, knowing the basics of uh, the your laser uh, machine your floors in machine so you need to actually do that it's a hands on in, uh, experience very important and then of course going forward and you're not just uh, training them to be technicians but you need them to be reporting very accurately and it needs to be focused or so all our fellows at uh, nai we uh, all of them have the postings and they do a significant amount of uh, uh, um, investigation work themselves so uh, photography b scans and oct 
So in proficiency with intervention, needless to say, that's critical. Uh, we have this model I where uh, the fellows at the beginning start about uh, 10 to a dozen uh, models have to be done first. And then the first two dozen cases are very strongly mentored and they're followed up by the uh, consultant and only then can they go on to semi-independent and independent lasers. Same thing with the injections. Uh, the pre-injection protocol needs to be very strongly uh, grounded in. And uh, yeah, uh, and the uh, models need to be seen and then they go in from injections from uh, uh, the lower end injections and then slowly graduate on to the higher end injections. And all this is done by the Very important is the d culture, the department DNA needs to be set in, you know, in terms of discipline, attendance, punctuality, a strong dress code, take adhering to break times. The work ethic needs to be strongly honed in, the sharing of work. There is no such thing as this is my work, this is your work. Needs to people, the, uh, fellows need to understand that there has to be a lot of sharing of work. An attitude to colleagues, staff, patients, uh, you need to ensure as a leader that there is a, there's, the work needs to be f a fun place too. So if you, there's always a saying that if, you, if the work is fun, then you are not really working every day. So that kind of a light atmosphere, but in the background of having strong uh, discipline set up too. And then importantly, that's when you transition from a, dis a department to a team and the boss achieve yourself as to a leader. So, you know, a leader needs to walk the talk, practice what one preaches. And the team needs to see their leader, you know, see cases with them, be a role model, quality documentation, meticulous exam, uh, ensure work efficiency. And remember that the buck needs to stop with you and uh, you need to take that uh, call too. Mentoring is something which is critical and I think different institutes have different programs and different ways of doing it. It's also uh, dependent on whether that particular institution is, has an appointment-based system or walk-ins. It's more easy to do a mentoring, strict mentoring program when you have an appointment-based system, unlike ours, but we try to do the same to some extent. We have minimum quantum of cases that a fellow sees, which is seen by the consultant in terms of finals, and it happens uh, the way we've designed ours is like, you know, the surgical fellows are tied up with that surgeon, and they generally follow them you know, pre and post-op. The le learning objectives need to be specified, as I mentioned earlier also, at the beginning of a month, so the fellow needs to know, this is what I need to learn in this month. And then you keep uh, you know, checking that status evaluation. And this proficiency is also in not just surgical, but medical retina also, as well as diagnostics and lasers and injections. And the objectives are then assessed by the consultant every weekly and at month end, and then a feedback is conducted by the head, and then we uh, you know, check on the fellow's status and his progress. Communication is critical. I mean, the head, I think, needs to be approachable, accessible. Transparency needs to be there in whatever decision is taken for the fellow. Clarity of role is also critical. Regular team meetings, individually with fellows, consultants, and the whole department, as well as one-on-one -on -one is also important. And then you, issues will always be there that needs to be resolved at the earliest. As I mentioned earlier, uh, fellows, apart from scholastic, you need to look at soft skills too. Finally, encouraging uh, excellence in academics, didactic and classes, you n it's ideal to have short focus topics rather than very wide, uh, you know, one and a half hour topics. 30 minutes, I think, is ideal with 15, 20 minutes of interaction. And all fellows, that's one thing we uh, emphasize, needs to be, they need to be prepared. Case presentations, journal clubs are the way, and we have a you know, schedule uh, right through, uh, you know, going on. And publications also something that we are focusing also on case reports, case series, retrospective short studies to begin with, and then moving on to the larger prospective studies is vital and useful if a fellow attends at least one research methodology workshop and is schooled in research methodology training uh, through that period and takes up at least one research product uh, project per year. Presentations also at good meets like AOS, VR, Seretnet, DRF, RIC, and Asia Pacific meets, and also encouraging fellows to take up benchmarking exams. And we are happy to report that in our four and a half years, some of our uh, fellows have passed all these exams, FACO, ICO, and FRCS. Surgical has also been ta talked about by Dr. Guru Prasad. We encourage this obvious grading graded learning kind, with the surgical steps and then going forwards. Uh, wet lab was not really possible during the co uh, COVID period, but now we are trying to revive that. Uh, Madurai and Coimbatore have a surgical simulator. Surgical recordings is what we are doing now a lot and then reviewing them. And also in our center, fortunately, we have the uh, digital uh, ingenuity system, uh, DAVS, as well as the analog, so uh, fellows get uh, exposure to both kinds of this thing. Clinically, again, as I mentioned, uh, apart from the examination and the diagnostics, we try to, you know, focus on, ask fellows, you know, what is the case of the day? What interesting case? It just need, doesn't have to be a case from diagnostic point, but something, some interesting finding, some interesting uh, angiographic uh, uh, depiction, something interesting on the OCT. I keep telling them, if you have not learned anything that particular day, 
that particular day in your fellowship is wasted so you need to be your radar needs to be tuned uh, to that when you leave that department that day you should have taken something from the department an important thing is archiving challenging cases for presentations and grand rounds they need to almost constantly be on the toes and then importantly working and following my cases and research projects also innovations this morning we had a series of excellent you know talks in that out of the apple tree i'm very happy that aws is you know pursuing this it encourages out of the box thinking and we're seeing most of the presentations are from younger of uh, uh, students and many of them were fellows so that brings up helps you know them with bring up cre creative solutions most of them are about in instruments <laughs> techniques you know in exam places or surgical but also importantly in practice changes and we saw a lot of that happening during the covid period also tech adaptations i think the younger generation is positionally that finally you know creating leaders you know sublet responsibility don't take everything as a leader upon yourself so create a leadership ladder sublet responsibility oversee progress keep an eye on the process though avoid micromanaging allow innovation but also importantly just focus on results so as a, as a leader you know having spent a lot of time you may have certain mindsets it's important to be flexible with your mindset all this helps generate efficiency and a sense of ownership also handling discord in agreement you know i think it's important to show that there is fair play in the system and you need to be amicable to solutions okay. attention to uh. students fellows and colleagues uh, ends up having a snowball benefit effect on your patients oh. thank you Thank you. Thank you, Anand, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Any comments from Kim, sir, please? I think uh, Anand covered the overall, the entire spectrum of how to go about to the pay, uh, students, but it's very important to one basic thing what Dr. Shobit uh, was talking about is how to make them think independently, ask this question, why? Why? And that's very important uh, to impart in this uh, students among the fellows. I, I agree with your point, sir. Uh, I think uh, this is the last talk. I will try to finish faster, and then we can have discussion for five minutes. Also, we have UVI expert Dr. Kalpana here. Uh, a little bit about how you mix and match the retina and the UVI training. Because uh, when, when they choose for retina practice, and many UVI patients starts coming up, and uh, how much do they really need to get exposed, especially to the UVI practice, I think I want you to just answer uh, uh, a minute on that. So I think the Anand sir has covered all the topics of all the four speakers, so I don't have to really, but it's good thing to have the, uh, the talk at the end so that you will get speakers and the audience from the next session also. That's the advantage of uh, <laughs> being in. Sometimes when you try practicing in the niche speciality like retina, uh, it's always the, the thing. So the perspective here of the talk is b both because when, when me and Dr. Chitra were discussing about this, so it directs both to the teachers as well as, that is the trainers as well as the, the fellows, both together. So the basic expectations of the fellows, uh, I think we all discussed about it. Will I? But th they should be able to manage a patient. That's how is most important. Rather than kitne katne ko milega, kitna chances milega, kitna surgery milega, should get chances to learn new skills and hone the existing one. Get a chance to be a part of the research activities and should know their competent levels and their limitations, understanding their needs. The personalization can. What I suggest is because sometimes the fellows become a liability. That's my another question to the panelist after this talk, that do you have any of the kind of rubrics or anything where after three months you get to know that the fellow is not performing well, who did extremely well, and he gave the best impression during the inter interview, and unfortunately not performing well. So how do you go with that fellow? You try to terminate him, or you try to give an extra coaching, try to hone him, I think is the question. I, I request the panelist also to answer for that. That's because sometimes they become a liability. And they, they speak very unruly behavior with the patient. So how are you going to deal with those fellows? So it's, it's always better to uh, plan them accordingly, sit with them, talk to them, and try to find out out of the box, out of the session, or out of the, the clinical environment what's going on. And, and, and in those cases, I think, can plan the fellowship that is based on their competencies. So the work atmosphere, it was the inter interesting paper here. You can see the consequence of work environment on employees. It was published in the Indian Journal of Business and Management. Behavioral component of the office environment have a greater effect on productivity than the physical components alone. So, and satisfaction of the employees towards overall workplace environment leads to productivity. I think having a better work environment for the fellows is definitely important. The must and do's for your specialty is definitely what the fellows needs to know about it. The good to knows, the once in a while, 
And when you are starting your practice, why I, I, I suggest all my fellows that don't do a complex cases like PDR or stage 4, stage 5 ROPs or complex retinal detachment because any of these recurrences might always not give a good name when they especially do a standalone retina centers when they try to put it up. The symbiotic association that is both the planner and the students should know their responsibilities and the reasonable expectations. In the training, the interesting thing I found out was the Dreyfus model of being how you start from the novice, the advanced beginner, competent, proficient. This is how the Dreyfus model of skill acquisition is based on. The novice, unconsciously incompetent, where you do not know that you don't know how you to do something. Then becomes an advanced beginner, consciously incompetent. That means you don't know that you don't know how to do something, but that keeps bothering you how to do that. That's basically uh, these things can be taught by the surgical, you know, uh, seniors, surgical residents whom you are following or mentoring with, or a senior resident or the senior fellow can definitely bring them out from this category and then put them in the competent section where you become consciously competent. That is remediation by the faculty, the senior faculty where they comes into the play and they then try to modify you and then finally you become an expert and then go off from the institution. So the lacunae is the lack of explicit competency based assessment. In India in most of these curriculum we don't have this focusing more on theory rather than competency and ignoring the attitude and the communication part. I think Dr. Anand rightly spoke about the attitude and aptitude. So what's the traditional model, model, model most of us will still follow during a residency? Curriculum drives it. Curriculum drives the ex uh, educational objectives and the assessment. However, the most important now we need to look into is the competency-based educational models. That is where the health needs, what the health system needs, the competency outcome, assessment, that should probably, it, it drives the curriculum and not the curriculum driving it. So the attitude and aptitude, I think he has already mentioned about it, but this is about the ACGME current assessment system, how it's going on, the system-based practice, professionalism, what is being taught about, interpersonal and communication skill, practice-based learning, patient care and medical knowledge. I think these all have been already covered about the knowledge, the OSCEs, there are seminars, symposiums, the various exams uh, being given, FRCS, FICO, FAICO, skill-based, that's the ICO rubrics. If your fellows can definitely go into the ICO site and try to check your skills through the ICO rubrics. Attitude, I'll come to that, the professionalism and the overall competence, that is ICO 360 degree uh, assessment tool. So this is again available in the website, uh, ICO 360 degree assessment tool, where we can check it. And simulation model, definitely wet lab, dry lab, mannequin, computer driven, uh, even help me see in ISMSICS society, we have started that huge machine. Although it's expensive, you can de definitely go in once in a while, drive to Mumbai and try to do how the cataract surgeries are being done, help with the electronic sim simulators. We have the slots for that, so we can give you. Before you touch on the human eyes, I think it's better to do that. And of course, virtual reality is definitely what we have learned through this difficult COVID times. This is the another thing is the evidence for effectiveness of the simulation is based on the Kirkpatrick's four level of education values. So the most important I would like to touch upon is you all must be knowing about the, the George Miller. The George Miller is the Miller's assessment of pyramid. He explained us why professionalism has to be inclu included in the medical education. The practice of medicine is an art not a trade or business. It's a calling in which your heart will be equally exercised with your head. It's now agreed that professionalism must also be taught besides being caught. So what does this professionalism? Professionalism means only speaking good to your patients or improving your communication skills? No, it amounts for accountability. We have to be accountable for our patients. Altruism, excellence, humanism, sound understanding of ethics, good communication skills and of course the clinical competency. This all structures the professionalism. And why we need to assess the core competency? The reason for assessing professionalism is to determine whether medical learners acquire and practicing physicians have because medical learners will attempt to master a subject only if they know that they are being assessed. And that's what it says, assessment always drives learning. So we need to know the fellows, even the senior most has to be assessed by somebody. Then only we, we have that the will to drive 
to go. Yes, I have to do correct. If I don't come on time, then they will not come on time. Who is going to inspect me? If I'm the So the rules from the watchman to chairman, what these uh, business management people speak about, I think that should apply in most of the institutions. It has to be because they don't respect what you expect. They respect what you inspect. So studies from the West have shown that students demonstrating unprofessional behavior during their undergraduate or postgraduate are more likely to be found guilty. Because the Medical Council of India, I think they have now included this professionalism, but until all these years, we were lacking behind from the Western studies where the professionalism was definitely taught as a different subject. So the assessment during the medication, uh, medical education and training, self-assessment, peer-based assessment. Ask your fellows, how did I do the vitrectomy today? How did I do the buckle today? Did my hands shake? Did I put a uh, buckle well? Did, uh, did I make a, uh, any difficulty in placing the suture under the buckle? So all these, I think your fellows, your sisters, your colleagues, who are nurse, uh, nurse assistant, uh, assistants, you should ask them. You should have kind of rapport with them. I think that will definitely drive you. And new approaches to social media. This is very, very important because I have seen many of the fellows, not just Retina, see any interesting patient, we put it up in the Facebook. Wow, what a fantastic patient I had. Having a sub-ILM bleed, I saw it, one of our fellows uh, posting it up and I said, I just remove it. Sub-ILM bleed in a patient is not, is, it must be how you treated it is fantastic to you, but not to the patient. Let's look into this video. No sound. It's okay. So this is happened in University of Columbia where the nurses, the assisting nurses, the assisting surgeons were all dancing. You know, the, the patient is being taken for some 8 hours to 10 hours of spine surgery. And then you see the painting on the back. And this was unfortunately put it up in one of the social media. You know what happened? They lost their jobs. Losing jobs in the western countries, it's very difficult to get it back. So whenever we are posting on the social media, especially to our postgraduates and the fellows who are very enthusiastic of doing a wonderful surgeries, we understand it, but not the local public. So I, I think we need to have some ethics in posting up in the social media as well. That's also a very important point. So again, I think drawing the charts, this is a study holiday, how I used to do it, set up a timetable, practical, two hour principle, and mocking it up in the exams. Now coming to the few more parts is about the fellowship abroad. Many, many students keep asking about it. Sir, after fellowship, should I go abroad? Should it better? Definitely, first I always suggest is to have an Indian fellowship. And having a Western fellowship abroad, either in the Asian or the Western, you get the, the taste of the different surgeons, how they do about it, how they look about it, how they try to handle the patients, what is the interpersonal communication skills, how they deal with the patient, how they touch the patient. With. So all these things I think will definitely be improved. You have definitely uh, uh, various fellowships, uh, programs available, short-term fellowship, long-term fellowship. And I always say that before you do a long-term fellowship, have an observership, that is the dipstick test, I would like to call it. And definitely try to join the, these voluntary organizations like Orbis or anything where they try to uh, bring you up and you go to different countries, you get a good exposure before you want to start your own. So International Council of Ophthalmology Fellowships are also there, ICO, rubrics and all. And another important thing I request you all is to do uh, some other specialty courses also. You should know how to manage, manage your finance, how to do a good human, how to be a, a good human resource manager. You need to hire, you need to uh, take people inside, you need to run the hospital, run the show, and all those things. I think doing a hospital management course is definitely not a wrong idea. Choosing the right path, again, you have to, I, one thing, answer to this all questions, whether you want to join institution, private practice, medical, solo, all this, please ask your mentors. They are your best guides. They have seen you for all these years, they know how you are, they know how you are going to do further. So just close your eyes and ask your mentors. I think they'll be the best people, best teachers to suggest you what you should do further. So I think with this, I'll come to the end. Last point, patientology. The many physicians are unaware of their behavior and psychological aspects of the patients because of an absence of systematic program that translate the physician's interest in patients into the actual practice of medicine. The newly designed, designated field, which might be called as the patientology. Unfortunately, again, these skills are never taught formally in our medical colleges. Some doctors have great bedside manner because they have high emotional quotient. 
So who are patientologists? Empathetic, who can understand what the patient's fears and worries are so that they can help to manage them. One way all doctors can become better patientologists is by teaching their patients how to become better patients. Right? So the good patients make for good doctors and it's possible to provide patients with a tool with a toolbox of skills which they can help to learn themselves. So finally, find the right balance, friends, scores, eating, exercise, sleep, work, family, all these are definitely important. Not just doing the ILM peeling, oh, of course, that's good. But also find, finding a good work-life balance is very important. And lastly, I would like to end this slide. During the press conference, he's the Steve Balmer, the, the chief of the Nokia company, he said, we didn't do anything wrong, but somehow we lost. And when the analyst analyzed that, they found out they missed out on learning, they missed out on changing, they lost their chance of survival. So what's the moral of the story? If we don't change, we shall be removed from the competition. So one advice to all our young ophthalmologists, young budding ophthalmologists, keep changing yourself, keep innovating yourself. Thank you very much for the patient clean. Okay, I think uh, one last question from Madam regarding the UVA thing. We have one minute. What Anand said, uh, you know, I completely agree with whatever he said. We follow the same thing. But I would just like to add, we also have about uh, one and a half to two months at the end of the fellowship as well, because that's when they realize what UVA is. And, uh, Sir, do you have this in the urban system also? where you try to put them, post them under the UVA posting? They will spend one month uh, in the first year, and then, and then again in the second year they post it there in the UVA. Uh, Mahesh, sir? I think they become more serious then. Yeah. Oh. Okay, thank you very much for the patient listening. I think we'll give the time. Thank you, Shobit, sir, Anand, sir, Kim, sir, uh, Naresh, sir, and uh, Mahesh, sir for their expert opinions and uh, thank you panelists uh, and thank you my dear delegates and who have been sitting so patiently. I think Ramesh sir is uh, looking at me most of the I don't know whether he was looking at the slides or at me but definitely I give the stage open to you sir uh, for the pediatric ophthalmology. Jyoti madam is also laughing. I request them to please come on forward. Sound Thank you.